definitely it's a, an interesting uh, topic. Uh, uh, many things are going on <coughs> on this issue uh, every day, every hour, every minute. So it will be good to listen to to, to Mark. Uh, Mark is the co-founder and director of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations is a pan-European uh, think tank. This means that they have presence in uh, different uh, European capitals. Uh, as far as I know, it's in the five uh, largest uh, EU countries, uh, plus two Eastern European countries. So this means that they are present uh, in, <coughs> they, have a, they are able to have a good view of, of all of, of Europe. The council was uh, launched, was created in 2007, so it's a, quite a young institution, uh, but nonetheless, I think it has consolidated itself as a, as a, as a reference among European think tanks in these uh, five years in which it has been uh, active. Uh, <clears throat> I've been following the, the European Council uh, for quite some time. Uh, thanks also to the work of Jose Ignacio Torreblanca, who's the <coughs> director of the, of the Council in, in Spain, based in, in Madrid. And uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting institution, no, 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 not only because they are a truly think tank, they come with, with debates, with ideas, but because they, they are also very practical. I mean, they really want to, not only to do research, but to influence the, uh, the policy decision-making process. So they come up with practical ideas that want to have uh, an, an incidence. And uh, I think it's also t interesting to remark about the, the council that they always like to take uh, uh, the local point of view. I mean, I think here in Europe, uh, we tend to see, uh, for example, develop here in Spain, for example, we tend to see developments in, in Germany from a very Spanish perspective, okay? And then it's very difficult to understand the logic of what is going on and the decisions that are being taken by Germany. I think that uh, the council really uh, uh, makes a very big effort to understand the reality of uh, the places where decisions are taken, okay? I think Mark is an expert in that. His last uh, uh, book, as far as I know, which was a, a bestseller, uh, the title, I think it's very explicit in the sense, is What Does China Think, okay? It's an effort really to understand what, in this case, uh, a big uh, power like China uh, thinks. Uh, just a brief uh, note about Mark himself. He's been active as a political analyst, researcher, and advisor since he, since he was very young. He started with 24 as director of the Foreign Policy Center, which was a, a think tank uh, founded under the patronage of, of, of Tony Blair. Uh, <clears throat> today, as I was saying, he will talk to us about the, the, the political and economic construction of the European Union. I don't know whether he will be able to be very positive or whether, whether he will be very negative uh, about this, this process. I just want to remark that he, one of a uh, book that he published some time ago was, the title of the book was, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. So I think this gives us an indication of uh, at least what he thought uh, sometime, uh, some years ago about uh, the construction process of the European Union. With uh, having said this, I give the floor to Mark so that he can uh, do his presentation. Mark, please. Thank you. introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be back here, uh, both in this incredible city, but also uh, the th uh, uh, a meeting of the Thukulu. Um, I was very privileged a few years ago to be invited to talk at a conference when Narcisse Serra was the, the president of, of the Thukulu, and he's also been a very active and strong supporter of ECFR from the very beginning. So. I um, want to thank you uh, b before I start as well as thanking Nacho which means uh, for everything that he does uh, both in Madrid but also here to to help bring um, uh, th the uh, work of, of VCFR to, to life uh, for for people in uh, in this part of the world. Um, as you say it's true that a few years ago I wrote a book saying that Europe uh, would run the 21st century and shortly after it was published there was a no vote in uh, Holland and uh, and in France and people became very worried that Europe was going to be on the sidelines it would be boring 
probably irrelevant. No one would be very much interested um, in what happened in our part of the world as uh, the power shifted to, to Asia. Um, but actually, uh, I can say with some pride that the opposite has, has happened. I don't think Europe has been more present in the global imagination um, than it is at the moment since 2003-2004. Uh, uh, unfortunately, not for the reasons that I had hoped when I wrote my book, but uh, uh, I do remember in 2003-2004 traveling around the world and was struck how everyone from Beijing to Bosnia to Cairo saw us as a rising power that was developing a constitution that had plans for a common foreign policy led by a, a common foreign, min uh, foreign minister. And people were so excited that I think it was in 2003 that Wen Jiabao, the Chinese prime minister, declared the, that, that year the year of Europe and went to great lengths to show how the Chinese um, were investing in this new rising European superpower. And they contrasted that with uh, George Bush and Washington's policy of dividing and ruling the, the member states of the, of the European Union. Um, so... Today, uh, people are, are interested in the European Union again, but unfortunately this time the concern is, is with European implosion rather than Europe's rise. And we're seen as a problem rather than a solution to problems in different parts of the world, more of an object of uh, attention than a subject uh, in the new global order. But actually this attention is not entirely negative because the European Union's biggest problem I think even and maybe particularly in its member states is that we are too ready to take for granted what has been achieved over the last few decades and uh, don't imagine fully how much is at stake and how much we have to lose if we don't manage to find a way through through this crisis uh, so um, I think I'm not going to talk too much about the exact dynamics of the of the summit which has just happened and and the day-to-day -day politics. I'm happy to do that in the questions uh, and the discussion afterwards. But I think it was a good summit. Um, I think that more was achieved there that, than has been achieved in many other areas, and and it does show the potential for a real breakthrough. But uh, it, it will just buy us time to deal with the real structural problems, and that's why it's maybe a good. Uh, time to take a step back and to to think both ab about uh, what is at stake, what the global context is, what made the EU special um, and what makes it worth fighting for. Secondly, to an analyse more clearly what the real threat it to, to Europe is and what the problems are, the structural problems that will need to be dealt with. And thirdly, maybe to, to look at what could be done differently to save the European Union and in practical terms how we could go about doing it in a uh, uh, an EU where the politics are very very difficult to, uh, in different countries and I want to reflect particularly on on how the crisis looks through German eyes because I think that is going to be a, a key part to any uh, resolution of this so I'm going to do those three things uh, relatively quickly um, uh, and I'm going to try and do it from the perspective of, of looking from the outside in. So maybe looking at Europe through through Chinese eyes, because they were good. Uh, I think they're good observers of, of what the big picture looks like, rather than uh, being too stuck in in the kind of day-to-day uh, -to -day politics which uh, uh, which we're dealing with here. So uh, speaking personally, as I said, I, the reason I wrote this book on why Europe will run the 21st century is because I genuinely believe that the EU is the most exciting experiment in history, uh, not just because it ended war between European countries, nor because it supported the transition of uh, a whole range of different countries from the south, from the east, from dictatorship to democracy, or even because it's become, it's come to enshrine important values uh, on the world stage. I think it's the most exciting project in history because it's the biggest innovation in how power is exercised since the nation state was created 500 years ago. The, and what the EU has done is it's shown how citizens can enjoy living in small states that are close to their 
to to their citizens but at the same time enjoying the protection and economies of scale that you get from having an economy a market with 500 million consumers and common policies to tackle continent-sized problems from organized crime to climate change but more importantly than that the european union has shown that there is a very different way of thinking about security so rather than relying on a balance of power and not interfering in each other's internal affairs the EU model of security is based on deep economic, political, and above all, legal interdependence. So law courts have replaced armies as the way of dealing with disputes. And this European model, I think, has been a pioneer on the world stage that spread in four fundamental ways. Firstly, just by getting bigger, moving from 6 to 12 to 15 to 27 to 28 uh, members. Secondly, through the impact on its neighbours and the attempt to create a Eurosphere around it where these values uh, and these ways of working are uh, enshrined in our relationships with, with countries who depend a lot for us on our markets, on our investment, on aid, uh, and on political help. Thirdly, by creating a new generation of global institutions which enshrine a European way of working, um, from the World Trade Organization to the International Criminal Court. And finally, by inspiring every other region in the world to integrate themselves from uh, the Asian uh, attempts at creating an East Asian uh, Union to the African Union to Mercosur to all sorts of other attempts in every other part of the world. And I thought when I wrote my book that the net result of these trends would be that the world would neither be a unipolar space dominated by the United States or a global government run by the United Nations, but instead we would see a world of regions run according to principles that are comfortable for Europeans. And I argued then, and I still believe, that this European way of working and of exercising and organising power is uniquely well suited to an interdependent world with collective action problems. And for me, it's precisely because we're entering a world where Europe doesn't feel like it will be the centre of the universe that the European Union is important. Because uh, with the economic rise of the rest, uh, the American pivot to Asia the development of a G0 world where all the global institutions from the United Nations to the World Trade Organization seem to be bogged down to, uh, you know, it, it feels more urgent than ever that there is a European pole and that, that this European way of working becomes more widespread. But in order for that vision to happen, we need to fix our domestic uh, problem and to stop, to get through this existential crisis which the EU uh, has been going through. And uh, in order to do that, I think we need to understand much more clearly what, what, what's happening. Um, I'm not going to patronise you and talk about the, the economic uh, challenges. Uh, I think we, we all know about the central structural flaw of having a common currency without a, a, a common treasury. Um, and... Uh, of the many mistakes which have been taken uh, of, uh, in the management of different austerity programs which are becoming self-defeating and, and, and self-reinforcing. But um, I do think that, that it is helpful maybe to look at the, the problems from, from a bigger uh, picture perspective. And I was in China a few weeks ago and was uh, quizzed by all of the Chinese interlocutors that, that, that I spoke to. And I think that the trends that they picked up are quite helpful in terms of us understanding what's going on. I think the first thing the Chinese spotted is that Europe's crisis is above all political rather than economic. It's a, a crisis of, of democracy. So if the flaw in Europe's uh, economic construction is this single currency without a common treasury, the flaw in its political construction is the creation of a common policy making system without a common politics. And instead of having a real political sphere where we could have arguments about what kind of Europe, what kind of economic policies we want to pursue, we've had a growing conflict between technocratic political establishments uh, who do not explain what is being done to, to their citizens, do not create a basis to, to, uh, for, for European policies, um, that have sought to build Europe over the last few decades and populist oppositions that have tried to, to undermine it. And I think what we're witnessing now, this is me speaking rather than the Chinese, is, is nothing less than the breakdown of the European political order. 
and the end of the permissive consensus that allowed the European Union to be created. And the problem which we're facing, the biggest problem in terms of actually getting the the economic steps that everyone knows are necessary is the impossibility of creating a political consensus for that at a time when the national political systems in every uh, member of the European Union are going through a period of profound uh, crisis. Um, If you look around a map of the European Union, you can see how uh, there is uh, uh, country after country, like from Holland to Finland to Greece to Ireland to Italy, the mainstream parties are being pushed to the sidelines and parties that used to inhabit the fringes are becoming the mainstream, either because they're the biggest parties uh, in elections and they get the most votes, or because they are the ones who are setting the political agenda and it's to them that other parties are responding. I was just in, I've just come directly here from Austria where you have the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats in government together in a coalition, but they feel like they're under siege from the Freedom Party, Jörg Haider's old party that is on the outside that's bigger than any of them and that's setting the agenda on, on Europe. I was talking to a Finnish cabinet minister a few uh, months ago, and he said to me, uh, we're scared shitless. Um, The only way that we can deal with the true Finns is by cloning them. So the most Eurosceptic things, the opposition to the European stability mechanism being allowed to recapitalize Spanish banks, um, is not coming from the true Finns, from the populist party. It's the social democrats who are saying that they need collateral uh, for their contributions because they're so scared of the the Finns on the outside and I think if you look around this map what you can see is that this isn't just a European Tea Party moment when the old hierarchies are under pressure but actually we could see the most profound reworking of the of the European political system at a national level that we've seen since 1945 or even 1917. I think it's much bigger than what happened in 1989. And the most tragic element of this is that it is Europe which is emerging as the key fault line around which this is based. Um, There was a, a void that developed at the heart of many representative systems because you both had the citizens uh, leaving the political sphere, not joining parties, not voting, not participating in active politics and you had the parties retreating into government and becoming appendages of the state and that void is now being filled by these new parties that are, that are, are using Europe as the way of, 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 of attracting support and you can see that in, in, in Holland which is another country that is uh, opposing the, the, uh, the, the, the deal in the, in, the, in the last summit where uh, Gert Wilders used to get his political support by attacking Muslims and, uh, and immigration but it's now Europe which is the main basis of his, of his political campaigns. The second thing the Chinese pointed to, which is interesting, are some institutional trends. So the, they they uh, they talk a lot about renationalisation. Back in 2003, when Europe was a rising power, they made a big deal about building their links with Brussels. But now they've decided that the real route to Europe lies through Berlin. Uh, rather than with Brussels, when Angela Merkel went to to China on her last trip, she was treated not as the leader of Germany, but as the leader of Europe, which from a Chinese perspective is understandable because almost half of the European exports to China come from Germany. So uh, there is a certain logic uh, to to that treatment. But But the way that they are trying to institutionalize the relationship goes way beyond simply thinking in economic terms what they're trying to what they've have started joint meetings of of the two cabinets uh sorts of committees that you get in the strategic dialogue uh which which china has with the united states but no other country in the world and this is all being channeled through berlin rather than through through brussels the second institutional thing the chinese uh asked me about uh interrogated me about even was the idea of a multi-tier europe they kept on saying to me, is it possible that European leaders are going to save the euro but accidentally kill the European Union at 27? And uh, uh, related to that was a question about my own country, Britain, um, and whether they thought that Britain might leave the European Union. Um, if you really want to know what will happen, it's painful for me to talk about. <laughs> but um, I do think it's it's very likely that 
uh, all the main political parties will commit themselves to have a referendum on EU membership in the next parliament. Um, next parliament will last probably until 2019, so it's a long time away. It doesn't, it's not something which is for, for tomorrow. But it looks now like the Conservative Party is in order to deal with the fear of going back to my point about the Europe emerging as this political issue. In Britain, there's this fringe party, the UK Independence Party, that wants to withdraw from the European Union. It gets about 10% in the polls at the moment, which is much more than it's ever had before. No chance, really, of winning any seats in the British Parliament. Yet, they're setting the agenda on Europe in a way that is quite extraordinary because of the, the, the uh, because of various uh, changes in the political system. But the Conservatives will probably... Uh, pledge to renegotiate certain bits of, of EU uh, legislation like the working time directive, social policy, uh, justice and home affairs issues, and then have an affirmative referendum on what happens so that people will vote in favour of this package or not. And the government will leave it ambiguous about whether they would vote in favour or against staying in this uh, revised thing, depending on what happens uh, in the negotiations. So a very crude form of blackmail um, but it's the kind of blackmail that might not work because it's sort of blackmail when a, uh, which a crazy man has when he points a gun at his own head and says, if you don't give me what I want, I'll shoot myself. Um, <laughs> uh, the Labour Party thinks that's insane and doesn't want to do that, but they're worried about being told that they're undemocratic because they promised a referendum on the Constitution and then didn't have one on the Lisbon Treaty. So there is pressure within the Labour Party to have uh, to commit themselves to a referendum and they want to commit themselves to a sensible referendum about a real question so it will probably be an in-out referendum but against the backdrop of a crisis it seems very difficult to win any referendum in any country on Europe at the moment so the danger is that they will commit themselves to doing a three-part referendum where you vote either for joining up with whatever comes out of these into these integrationist moves or you commit yourself to the current status quo or you leave the European Union, which would have the perverse effect of, of binding Britain through the blessing of a popular vote to a European Union, to a membership of a European Union that probably won't exist anymore because everyone else will have moved on from there. But anyway, that's a, a small diversion uh, on on um, on Britain. But the, anyway, the third thing I think the Chinese spotted was, was uh, a crisis of the European order because in our minds... The way that Europe is organized is around the institutions of the European Union. But weirdly, the Chinese have already moved on mentally from the European Union, not just in terms of renationalization, but they're also thinking about creating new institutional structures for Europe. And there was this interesting vignette in that regard in April when the Chinese persuaded the Poles to organize an EU, uh, sorry, an Eastern Europe China summit modeled on the Chinese African summits, which also gives you a sense of where Europe is in the Chinese imagination, that Africa is the is now the model for how you deal with with uh, with the European periphery. Um, and the officials in Brussels were shocked by this aggressive move because the Beijing did not distinguish between EU and non-EU members, so they invited non-members like Serbia, Bosnia, other countries. Secondly, they didn't bother inviting anyone from the European Commission or any of the EU institutions and thirdly they wanted to create a permanent secretariat which would help uh, manage this this relationship uh, but the biggest question I think in all this is about how these uh, institutional and political changes will affect the EU as a as a foreign policy actor and there I suppose the the real question is whether the Europe that emerges from this crisis is going to be one that wants to shape a global order or whether the member states are just going to be content responding to decisions made elsewhere. And before the crisis, all member states signed up to a strategy of a global Europe with, with the ambition to shape a global and regional order collectively, but it wasn't clear that they meant it. And I think now there is a real danger that whilst people uh, theoretically sign up to that, they are looking more for uh, a foreign policy where uh, they model themselves on Singapore, Switzerland or Qatar, where they go for a low-cost Europe. You let Cathy Ashton negotiate with the Iranians, but you try and find what political and economic space you can in a system that is defined by others. And I think that 
the the danger of that is that it will lead to a G2 world where the decisions are taken in Beijing and in Washington and where Europeans are uh, basically hemmed in uh, to, to to take decisions which are which uh, which are made elsewhere rather than actually trying to shape that order and if you go back to where I started with this I think the tragedy is that the order which has emerged over the last few years has been a result of a of a G3 rather than a G2 you know it, because Europeans have pushed for multilateral solutions for institutions to deal with world trade for other sorts of issues and Many people have asked if the liberal order can survive in a post-American world, but I think there's an even bigger question, which is whether uh, without a European Union that has been... If America was the sheriff of the old uh, order, I think the European Union was its constitutional court, and without the European Union pushing for, for these institutional solutions, will that kind of world order survive? So that is the, the th sort of third question that they raised. But anyway, that leads me to where to the conclusion. I've already been speaking a lot so I'll, I'll just try and wrap up by talking briefly about what is to be done so I, I've written a, a report I've got a few copies here with which both sets out a bit about what's wrong with the current approach but also some ideas of, of where we could move from here and in the report we we sort of explained that last summer Angela Merkel looked over the precipice of, of euro collapse and she didn't like what she saw and decided in that moment that she was going to do everything that she needed to do to to save the euro but unfortunately her definition of what she needed to do um hasn't always delivered uh what um what 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 Europe hoped for um there were three kind of core impulses i think there's an attempt to minimize the cost of bailing out crisis countries which has put uh it accidentally uh, all of the countries under deflationary pressure and actually sent the cost of borrowing spiraling there's an attempt to enforce rules uh, regardless of the effect on the real economy which has led to crazy situation where countries are punished for taking reforms and which leads to a to a natural revolt in countries against any kinds of reforms and makes reform more difficult to sustain and there was an attempt to impose decisive action through a Franco-German duo, which actually ended up, rather than creating decisive action, creating paralysis by stimulating populism and opposition to, to what was going on. Um, individually, each of these approaches had their own logic, but collectively what they did was they made the European Union seem stingy, rigid, and oppressive. So in the place of that way of dealing with it, we tried to set out an alternative vision for a Europe, of, we call it a Europe of incentives that is seen to be generous, flexible and empowering rather than stingy, rigid and oppressive. And I, I, I'm happy to talk in the discussion about the specific ideas in this, but maybe just to end, um, might be worth talking a bit about the where Germany's coming from. Because I think if we're going to make progress, we need to understand a bit more clearly than certainly people in my country do about what is shaping uh, the German approach and what could actually um, allow Germany to, to play a more, uh, the sort of role that, that Europe hopes it will play. And uh, I think the starting point is to understand how the, the historical pressures on, on the German position, much is made of the sort of pathological fear of inflation from the 1920s, but it is still true that the guilt of, of about the 30s and fears of a breakdown of European order make the German elite far more responsive to arguments about what's good for Europe than any other p political system uh, in Europe. Uh, but there's also a third memory which is much less discussed, which is a sense of betrayal over European political union from the 1990s. In 1994, two prominent German politicians, Wolfgang Schäuble and Karl Lammers, offered the then French Prime Minister Edouard Balladur the prospect of joining them in a hard core of a political union as a quid pro quo for, for, for EMU. And the French didn't even have the grace to, to respond. And I think that's the backdrop to the debate about uh, Eurobonds at the moment, where the French are worried that, sorry, the Germans are worried that the French will take them for a ride again. Um, and that is why in Germany everyone talks about you know this idea of um, uh, having to give up 
the, their credit card without any control over what's going to happen with the spending. And that's what's leading this, 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 this discussion about political union there. Um, but I do think that the opposition in Germany is playing a fundamental role in reshaping the debate there and is what made it possible actually for Merkel to to move quite a long way at the uh, at the last summit and um, there is uh, though it's absolutely obviously true that you can't have political union as a prerequisite for banking and fiscal union it's wrong for other people to dismiss the idea as a as a red herring and a and a distraction but my worry is that the europe which uh, though angela merkel talks about a political union i think the bigger danger is that we'll create an apolitical union where elections allow citizens to 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 change governments but not policies because all of the economic decisions are taken out of the political realm and enshrined in constitutions um, so I think we need to have, though you need some sort of democratic legitima legitimation, uh, but I don't think the solution is to create the European Commission as a European government accountable to the European Parliament. I think instead we need to find a way of making national governments play a more visible role, uh, which increases their accountability for what they're doing. And one idea for that would be, instead of decisions being taken by uh, diplomats who meet in Brussels, having a deputy, a council of deputy prime ministers that meets in Brussels, that is accountable to national parliaments and part of national governments, uh, and held accountable to to um, to a second chamber of national parliamentarians in Brussels. But anyway, that's uh, uh, not uh, obviously the most urgent question facing us uh, immediately. But I think unless we find ways of putting flesh on the bones of political union, it's going to be very difficult to persuade the German political class to, to move forward on these things. And we need to do that quickly because the, the Germany doesn't want to move until the last possible minute because it worry it wants time to work out how to introduce controls. It's worried that debtor countries will return to their bad habits if, um, if Germany socializes debt too quickly. But the brinkmanship that we have ahead of us is becoming so dangerous that we, as we all know, we could end up with a perfect storm, um, at which even Angela Merkel won't be able to stop. So uh, that's uh, a few thoughts to, to get a debate going, and I'm happy to, to go into more detail in, in the discussion afterwards. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, I think this was a very uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, you said that you just touch upon some of the issues that are at stake. I think you you talk uh, you, you touch many many different issues, many topics. I don't know if you introduce more clarity or more confusion to the <laughs> debate because uh, clearly it's a very complicated debate. Uh, it's a debate where we need to see the woods, not only the trees. I mean, we, we need to see where we're going. But there is also a sense of, of urgency. I mean, uh, there are things that need to be done urgently because otherwise, otherwise the whole the whole uh, the whole uh, institutional setup may may collapse. No. Uh, I want to take opportunity to start the debate before giving the floor to, to the audience to ask you uh, two very specific questions, uh, taking precisely on the last things that you said. Uh, one uh, is regarding Germany. Okay, uh, you you said uh, that the opposition is reshaping the debate in Germany, and this can explain the the change that Angela Merkel had in the last uh, summit. Uh, my question is: Does this mean that? Uh, we uh, the, the, the results of the last uh, election in North Rhine-Westphalen, I think, where where uh, the <coughs> conservatives uh, lost, uh, should be read also in terms of uh, EU politics. I mean, uh, is there a message there of the of the German voters that uh, we can uh, try to to understand? And the second question is more general. You insist a lot on the on the on the on the role of the German political class. Uh, regarding uh, their acceptance of a political union in, in Europe. Um, okay, clearly this is a very important issue, but isn't it a more, uh, even a more complicated issue convincing the French political class about uh, the need of that uh, political integration? I mean, these are brilliant and massive questions. On, on the German situation, I mean, the Germany has got a totally 
uh, unique political system for obvious historical reasons. So in many other countries, uh, there are heated debates about a whole series of issues, which in Germany have been taken out of the political sphere. It's a very strong elite consensus on uh, ni vida krieg, never war, never inflation, being in favor of Europe, being in favor of uh, the transatlantic alliance. Um, and there's also very strong uh, apolitical institutions from the Bundesbank to the constitutional court because part of the founding of the of the modern German Republic is a mistrust of public opinion and of politics uh, for historical reasons. Um, so therefore, the because the German public is not your best friend here. They're against seventy nine percent are against euro bonds. Most people don't think that they've benefited from being in the euro, um, and uh, most Germans would be very happy with a smaller euro without Greece in it, without a lot of other European countries uh, in it. But the elite consensus is 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 very powerful, and so far the elite still has more um, uh, freedom. The governments have more freedom to do what they want to do than in any other country because of the way that German politics has been set up. I don't think this is going to last forever. I think it's very fragile and you're seeing it fraying at the edges. The Pirate Party appeared from absolutely nowhere. They have no policies at all and they're getting double digits in some regional elections. Um, uh, I, two weekends ago, I spent a lot of time with Hans Olaf Henkel, who used to run the German Employers Federation, who two weeks ago set up a, an extra parliamentary campaign against the European stability mechanism. Um, but he doesn't think he's going to get anywhere because he, he, he thinks the elite is so committed to Europe that, they, that Angela Merkel will do what, what she wants to do. But I think what's interesting is the politics of the coalition because it's both the result of the regional elections like Nordrhein-Westfalen, but it's also the fact that sort of mentally, you know, the FDP are basically uh, not going to be the a bit a strong enough partner for Angela Merkel in the next government after the next elections. So mentally, she's already in a different political arrangement from that which she's in at the moment. And mentally, she's already in a grand coalition with the SPD, which is the most likely outcome of the next election. And the SPD uh, has traditionally been positioning itself as uh, both more in favour of growth, but also more in favour of, of socialising debt. You know, Steinmeier and Steinbrück wrote this FT article last year where they actually supported euro bonds. Because so, no Germans want euro bonds, they've taken a big step back from that. But they're still open to this idea of the the Council of Economic Advisors of, of having a debt redemption fund, which is basically euro bonds. Um, uh, but the pressure on Merkel from them is all in the opposite direction. It's all about growth and about, uh, about dealing with European solutions. Um, and then they've also been talking a lot with Hollande and there are links with Hollande. So I think that's a very positive... Uh, development and and does create some political space for her and um, that was what was very interesting about Anton Lev Henkel who's a slightly crazy Eurosceptic guy but what gave me some hope is that he's so depressed about the German situation from his perspective he said our only hope of because his big plan is to destroy the euro and to replace it with a neuro of northern countries and a suro of, of 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 southern countries he hasn't worked out where france will be he thinks alsace lorraine can be in the euro but the rest of france is not it's not welcome in his northern league um but uh but anyway he do, he thinks he's going to get nowhere in germany he thinks that that his big hope is is the dutch and the finns uh killing the 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 euro and and bailouts but anyway that gives uh that gave me some hope that he was so depressed about the situation from his perspective. On France, it, I mean, it's a real question. You know, that's I think the Germans are right to be worried about France and political union because only 37% of François Hollande's supporters in the presidential election voted yes to the European Constitution in 2005. Uh, so it's not just that he's packed the cabinet with people who are Eurosceptic, his foreign minister, his Europe minister, were all active members of the No campaign. Um, but 
I think he is a protege of Delors. He would be welcome. He would be comfortable making some political concessions. But there is a deep-seated um, uh, sovereigntist core in in France, which is going to need to be overcome. And how you do that is going to be a a, a big uh, challenge for him. But I think it might be. If we have a more intergovernmental vision of, of what political union looks like, a bit more like what I was describing than what Weidmann and Schreibler were talking about, I think it should be it might be possible to get the French to sign up to something like that. And I think that's that's more realistic anyway than than seeing the European Commission emerging as a kind of European government with a directly elected president, you know, combining the Van Rompuy and 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 Barroso posts and having direct elections. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, uh, so I think it will be something that looks more intergovernmental. And I think the French hopefully will, will sign up to that. But it was striking that their submission to the four presidents basically was very explicit about euro bonds, about socialising debt, about growth measures. But then they tried to, they said, we need a 10 year roadmap <laughs> on the political reform, which is a way of basically not shifting on the politics. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I have plenty of other questions, but I would open the floor to the, to the audience. Una pregunta? Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask you about the question of leadership. At some point, we we, we said that uh, we needed more the law called running the, the 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 countries of the European Union to to make it uh, going. And then, at a certain extent, we we understood that uh, Van Rompuy and and the new leaders could provide this leadership role. Uh, at the end, they they ended up being uh, deal makers more than leaders for the European Union, but. To what extent leadership is now crucial? I mean, the system have we have we built too complex a system to to just for leadership to make a difference, or you think that that could be a, a solution for for the current state of play? Thanks. Um, I, I I think we have a problem in the you you both need leaders and you need followers, <laughs> and um, the big challenge to Europe's political system is that there are no followers left. <laughs> People are sick of, of being taken to places they don't want to go. They're revolting uh, against the, the system. And the political elites uh, are therefore now the followers and are trying to work out where their publics are and to find a way of coaxing them to do things that they don't want to do. You know, I, I, it's clear, if you look at the German example, you know, one of the chairs of ECFR is is Joschka Fischer, who's a somebody who actually managed to overturn half a century of German pacifism and get them to to support uh, bombing the Serbs in 1999. And if you talk to him about Angela Merkel and what she's been doing, he says exactly what you were saying: is that it's a caricature. She needs to lead the Germans. She can't just tell them what they want to hear deny that she's going to do everything until the last second and then try and do it through the back door that that just creates greater cynicism and that if you had someone like him for example um <laughs> leading germany uh that you would be able to to move things forward i think there's that's obviously true i think if joshka fischer was leading germany um uh it would be much better than than with angela merkel leading germany but i, I do also think it 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 mistakes i think germany is unique in that sense as well in that for the reasons i talked about before you probably could have a real leader in germany because the elite has a bit more space to shape things and people do trust elites and experts a little bit more than they do in other countries but i, I my worry is that there's something more profound at state which is a crisis of representative democracy across the european union and the the sort of political leadership that you were talking about from cool and Delors is just not possible now in today's political environment and that that is what what is coming to the fore we're being punished for 40 years of of cool and de la, uh by citizens revolts across the board and that we need to to do things in a in a way which is um more respectful of their concerns um and which is more 
uh, open and participative than the way that the European Union was made before. Uh, so, uh, it'd be good if there was if, if there was more ability to lead in Germany. But I think in in other countries, that's that's I, I, that's not necessarily a solution. Also, I think in a, in a way, um, it it miss. Uh, understands the depth of the the crisis that we are in politically in different countries. So, okay. Una otra pregunta. I should say that uh, um, Joska Fischer was. Uh, among us, uh, with us uh, six weeks ago, I think it was, we had a big uh, <coughs> seminar here at the Circle Economia, and uh, he was, uh, as you said, uh, well, quite uh, critical on, on Angela Merkel's uh, leadership, so uh, that was very clear. Please. Hello. Um, my name is Elina Vilov. I'm, 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 I'm a researcher in CIDOB. And I, you, you put a lot of really interesting ideas on the table, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and, and see whether what you think of them. Wolfgang Münchauer has written a, an interesting article in, in the Financial Times lately saying that Angela Merkel was never serious about the political union and that it has become clear at the last summit when she said that, that not in her lifetime we will have the Eurobonds. And that basically Germany is, is following its old tactics of asking for a political union when, when they are sure that no one else actually wants it, so they can ask for it as, as much as they want that no one else will follow them. And that, that Germans were never serious. What is, your, what is your point of view of that? Um, also, you are advocating a more visible role of the national governments in Brussels. And I would like to ask you if you don't think that the national governments ha already are very visible in Brussels. Um, I, from my own point of view, I have think they have never been so visible in Brussels. Um, I was, um, when I was last in, in doing interviews in, in, the, in the parliament and, and in the commission, um, for example, in the parliament, in the past, the, the groups, um, the votes used to take according to the ideological lines. Now they take, take mostly case um, according to the national lines, and that is a completely new trend in the European Parliament. Also, I talked to, for example, to the head of cabinet of the Transport Commission, who said that they are dealing with a lot of, of, of uh, German local issues in the Commission, putting forward proposals which they had never done before in order to appease uh, Germany, but also be other member states. And, and ex an example of this was that they had to deal with a special exception for the firemen of Bavaria, who in Bavaria don't have to show a uh, driving permission, and they now want to have an exception on, on the whole Euro on the European level to 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 voluntary firemen to have an exception. So m maybe the national interests are s already very visible on the European level, and we need more European leadership instead of having more national leadership. And finally, I I think what you already mentioned a bit. Um, the Hofstadt has come come forward with very ambitious plans for the for the for the political union, and he's claiming that uh, although there is no political support at the moment among the European populations to for a political plan, but if they see that European leaders are serious about a more serious political reform that the people would follow, do you think that people would follow such a plan? Um, on Merkel. I, my basic principle is is when people say something to believe them unless I have good reason not to believe them. I think there's too much kind of cynicism uh, in this world. I, I think that she is sincere that she wants to save the euro. I do think that if you look at the people around her, like Wolfgang Schäuble, you know, they are really committed Europeans who have believed in political union for a long time. And when I talk to German politicians, both in the chancellery, in the different political parties, I... I uh, think there is a genuine concern about uh, what happens if you socialise uh, debt without having uh, democratic uh, legitimation for it because they're worried about the constitutional court uh, but also they're worried about how you can actually have controls on, on spending if you socialise debt. So I think these are really genuine concerns and I think we're wrong if we uh, if we dismiss them and I don't think that we will get anywhere actually if we if we do dismiss them. 
uh, have has it translated into a workable plan which uh, which which you could get consensus for at a European level? Obviously not. Um, is there even a consensus amongst Wolfgang Schäuble, Jens Weidmann, um, you know, Sigmar Gabriel, um, uh, Peer Steinbrück, uh, you know, all the different bits of the German elite? No, there isn't yet. But I think that, that the problem everyone accepts is there. And I think we do need to, to think about how we deal with it. And that relates a bit to your other questions. You know, how can we go about finding a solution to what to delivering political union and making the EU more of a political space uh, rather than the sort of technocratic space that we have at the moment where people evade responsibility, allow the Brussels institutions to do unpopular stuff uh, whilst not taking responsibility for, 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 for difficult things that are being done. Personally, I, I think the solution is to force member states into a position where they are actually having to uh, make their case and to defend uh, what they want and to have a real political debate amongst them because the only political leaders that have any credibility or legitimacy at a national level uh, and I know this is limited but are basically the heads of state and government nobody knows who their member of the European Parliament uh, is the European Parliament is a uh, is part of the Brussels bubble it's a completely technocratic institution its rules of operation means that you can't have real uh, debate because you need a two thirds majority on every issue that, that matters the European Commission 7% of British people know who the European Commissioner from our country um, is which is quite high I was surprised that it, the number was that, that sort of uh, high um, and is not going to have the legitimacy to impose things on people that, that they don't like and anyway, the member states don't trust the European Commission to do anything other than to implement what they're deciding. So if, in the real world, the only place that you can actually find uh, legitimacy is through the national governments. So the question is, can do we carry on with the state square where they meet in, in private, you don't know what's going on, they uh, basically say, we're not going to sign up to anything at all. And then afterwards, they talk about how things were imposed on them uh and and attack uh brussels for doing horrible things to them or do you try and find a way of getting national governments to behave differently and i, I that's i think what we're gonna have to do with political if political union is going to mean anything that's how we're gonna have to do it so i think you need to link the european political decision process much more deeply with the national political process that's why i i mean i don't think it's necessarily the solution to end well, I don't think it's necessarily brilliant, but I can't. That's the best idea I could come up with: was getting national deputy prime ministers based in Brussels, making the decisions, who would then be accountable to their parliaments, um, and having some kind of second chamber of national parliamentarians, uh, who would hopefully attract a bit more interest from the national media's, and mean that you'd have oppositions and media holding governments to account a bit more. But um, I think whatever solution emerges is going to be much more based around the council than uh, than around the EU institutions. And it would be better to institutionalise that because the alternative is Mercosy. You know, it will be stuff happening between a directorate of countries which is completely unaccountable, which no one knows anything about. There are no papers produced for it and decisions get presented to us on a take it or leave it basis. The, the you know, the alternative is not Barroso and Van Rompuy sitting down and coming up with a brilliant plan which is based on extensive consultation with the 27 member states and which is seen as really legitimate. I think it's either going to be a closed, self-appointed directorate based around Berlin that imposes stuff on other people or a way of trying to get the national governments to work together in a more legitimate way. Those are your two options in the real world, I think. <clears throat> uh, so I don't think that Verhofstadt's going to get very far with his plan. <laughs> Una pregunta més? No? Ok, uh, thank you, Mark. It's getting late even for, for Catalan standards, so it's time for, for lunch. Thank you very much for, for coming, for, for your presentation. Uh, you were here a year, and a, uh, a year and a half ago in Barcelona, I remember. It was at the beginning of the Arab Spring, and you talked a lot about that. Now you've come here. We are in the midst of <laughs> some big problems. Well, we hope you will be able to come again uh, uh, in not too, too long a time and that uh, you will talk about interesting things. Thanks for coming anyway. Thank, Thank you. you. If um, anyone's interested in this, there are a few copies. Uh. <laughs>